Every month, I make what's called a Snake Eye Impressions video, where I take suggested media by my patrons and uh, talk about them for a bit. Yurikuma Arashi is one of the anime that was consistently recommended, so I ended up finishing the series and covering it over the course of three different months. And what you're about to see is a slightly edited compilation of my three installments breaking down, analyzing, and reviewing Yurikuma Arashi. Full spoilers ahead, y'all. And because it's three different videos spliced into one, um, have fun enjoying all the weird fluctuations in my audio quality and all the changes in my lighting as I gradually ascend from what looks like a cold backroom walk-in fridge further and further towards the blinding light of the sun. Right now, as you hear this, the first episode in which I talk about Mawarum Penguin Drum is up on Patreon. I also completely review Scott Pilgrim Takes Off, and I'm several hours into the visual novel The House in Fata Morgana. If any of these interest you, or you want to hear me ramble about Has Been Hotel or Neil Gaiman's Mirror Mask, all of the Snake Eye Impressions videos are accessible for only $1 a month. Plus, you get to vote on the next things I check out. Okay, sales pitch over. Here's my breakdown and review of Yurikuma Arashi. Today we're talking about Yurikuma Arashi. This was suggested by Laura Rios. Uh, so I viewed the first four episodes of Yurikuma Arashi, and for full disclosure, this is not my first time seeing this anime. Um, in fact, I had seen it before, a few years ago, shortly after, I think, my second rewatch of Utena, as I was trying to get more into Ikahara's other material. Uh, I liked the series. I remember enjoying it, but it's also something that I don't remember a lot of. It's sort of a hazy memory where I knew going in that there was some stuff here about bears and lesbians and this idea of, like, separation and walls. And uh, going back to it, yeah, that, that's definitely the central conceit of Yurikuma Arashi. In terms of music and presentation, the opening theme is great. It's like this whispery, almost seductive bop. And then the ending theme, uh, as I remembered, was, is a banger. It's like a sugary uh, dance track. Uh, both are great, really enjoy both. And I'm someone who likes to watch the intro and outro, so that matters to me at least a little bit. Uh, for some background information on this uh, particular work, it is a 2012 anime, uh, again by Kunihiko Ikahara, known for Revolutionary Girl Utsuna, as well as some work on Sailor Moon. This is this gay cutesification, as I worded it in my notes, of bears mauling high school girls. Uh, apparently, it might have been based on an actual incident that happened like in the early 1900s called the Sanke Betsu brown bear incident. Um, I don't know anything about this personally, and it's kind of just an anecdote I saw on Wikipedia, so take it or leave it. But there may be historical inspiration, sort of similar how Penguin Drum takes inspiration from, you know, a, a traumatic incident. This seems to take a different sort of spin on that. But with the bears, it's taken to be this like big metaphorical thing that there's like this metaphor going on about social ostracization. I hope I'm saying that right. You know, people are socially ostracized and there's the perception of deviance. And so the thing with Yurikuma Rashi, like a lot of Ikahara work, is that the metaphor and the literal are intertwined in such a way that everything pretty much in any given moment can be assumed to probably be both, both literally there and a metaphor. And I think... This in Utsuna makes it very like layered as you rewatch the show and like dive deeper. With Yurikuma Rashi, I'm sure there's people who do get more each time they watch it. And I definitely understood it a lot better the second time than the first time. But one critique I would offer of Yurikuma Rashi is that it might get so focused on the metaphorical aspects of it that the literal get to be a bit confusing. Uh, I'll get to explaining that more as I go on, but I will say that Yurikuma Rashi, I don't think, does that marriage of metaphor and literal as well as something like Utsuna, but it is definitely, like, always there, and it's, sometimes it's barely even subtext. It's just, like, is the text. It's almost clearly stated at you what the point of everything is. So I think, like, the show is actually rather simple. Uh, maybe I'm underestimating it, but in my mind, it's pretty simple. It's just a little obfuscated. In terms of the world design, it's a modern world, kind of like ours, but it's in this constant state of disrepair and repair uh, over this idea of this wall being built. You're going to see like cranes and construction all in the background. Generally pretty minimalist and abstract, a little bit fantastical. And the thing that stood out to me upon rewatch was how uniformed and patterned it is. That basically so much of it is patterns and even the desks and the classrooms are like very uniform and like 
configured in such a way where it, it, it gives me this feeling that the world of Yudokuma Arashi, everything's got to be exactly in this specific place, and everything's like copy-pasted, which thematically makes sense because there's this idea throughout of this invisible storm that basically you're meant to fall in line with the group or the herd, and if you deviate from that, you are basically targeted for removal, essentially. You are kicked out of the group and therefore vulnerable. There's this part early on where, like, they talk about how it destroys indiscriminately, and that includes the lily flowers that are in the garden. And there's, again, a lot of metaphorical but also literal stuff involving, like, lilies and yuri. And very clearly, the first dialogue spoken in the show, they're so beautiful when they're blooming, I think we can be t here together okay. So even the first lines of the anime clearly conflate the lily flowers with the young girls and their gay relationship. Pretty much every character in this show uh, is female. There are still some male characters. Um, there's these three judges that are acting almost as like godlike entities. Uh, they're great. Uh, I love them. Uh, they're like precursors to what the cops kind of function as to some degree in Serzanmai, although less directly antagonistic. You could read something into it, the fact that there's very few male characters and three of the prominent male characters are way more powerful than the women. You could try to read something into that about male authority. There's also a brother character for one of the uh, bear characters. So like bears clearly have male characters. The judges, which could be male and bear, they have male characters. But the humans, I don't think we've seen a human male at this point four episodes in. Could be mistaken on that. I don't think even one's been really referenced. World essentially is that a long time ago, there had been this planet of bears that had been destroyed or blown up and fragments of it fell to earth through this meteor shower and when that happened it made all the bur the burrs the bears on earth rise up and start attacking humans and as a result humans built this wall of severance to keep them at bay so you flash forward in the first episode to the high school students and the main two characters are kureha and sumika and they are clearly in love with each other. And to the show's credit, it's like very clear. Um, this is probably, from my knowledge, Ikahara's most explicitly gay work. Uh, and obviously he dabbles a lot in like queer coding and uh, signifying gay relationships. But this one is just, it just is. Like it's just very clear. It's also probably Ikahara's most explicitly sexual work. And I do think that this could be an area of critique depending on your background and also what you think the lines are when it comes to sexualization. Because at the end of the day, Ikahara is, well, I think at this time, probably 40 something if I had to ballpark, like an older um, male director uh, having this storyline about high school girls in love. And it has like bordering on nudity. Like they cover things up, but like there's a lot of skin and a lot of sexualization. And I could see that not being well received depending on how you feel about that. What I will say in its defense is that because it is so very clearly what it is, it's there's no way you can accuse this of like queer baiting. There's no way this is like too subtle. It just is very in your face about like elements of attraction. And again, the metaphors are barely even hidden. So like they'll talk about like the bears want to eat girls and they'll talk about like how delicious they smell. And there's like so much conflation between a literal hunger of a bear wanting to eat someone and like a sexual hunger um, or like a hunger for love, like any kind of desire. So there's a lot of like overlap there there where when the bears are talking about eating the girls, it's like, well, it's kind of operating on at least two different frequencies there, depending on how much you want to read into that. In terms of the basic story, there are two girls that were in love. There's two bears that are in disguise as humans. Um, but when the main love interest character of the main character ends up getting killed and eaten by bears, we find out that the two bears that have been described disguised as girls, they are Ginkgo and Lulu. When Sumika is eaten, it isn't Ginkgo or Lulu, but instead it's another girl who we find out later is another bear in disguise that's been like picking off people and purposefully playing into this invisible storm idea by like maneuvering people to be ostracized so she can then pick them off and she finds them more delicious when they're like outcasted. And again, maybe there's more commentary there that you could read into about a type of person. The bears literally eat people 
as well as wanting to like consume them and eat them in terms of like love them and get attention. And because it's kind of both, I found it a bit jarring and confusing, especially the first time I watched it because I was stuck trying to figure out when to assume that eating someone meant literal versus metaphorical. And it seems to always be both. And that got a bit tricky for me. There's also a few moments where I think the story is told in a confusing way that unnecessarily makes things more confusing than it really needed to be. Like it's partly up to the order in which information is presented to the viewer. The first episode, you're just thrown in, present a lot of information, and then that character dies. And you'll see it flash back to the earlier parts of their relationship and the earlier parts of other characters' backstories as you go on. And it's not always clear what is a flashback. Like you'll just suddenly be shown a character who's dead back again. And you can infer that this is a flashback, but I did find it sometimes a bit clunky in terms of extolling, I don't know, uh, expressing this narrative. And because there's so much metaphor and it's got to move at this certain pace, I feel that maybe the anime doesn't have as many of those little moments that make something like Utena stand out. Um, Like, little tiny things that can add humor or maybe more personality and characterization. Like I struggled to really say much about uh, the girl who was eaten Sumika because we know that she's nice and friendly and she likes flowers and she likes the main girl. And then, then she dies and she's like super important to the story, but I, I struggled to be able to say much about who she is. So aside from like Lulu and the main girl, Kuriha, I'm not sure we have a lot of development for our main cast. Maybe also the girl who is a bear in disguise picking everyone else off. So overall, I really liked revisiting Yurakuma Rashi, and despite the fact that I'm like throwing in these critiques, I think it might be my second favorite Ikahara work. Uh, I know that might be a little controversial considering that it seems from what I hear Penguin Drum is considered like his second best or one of his best, but I really quite enjoyed Yurikuma Rashi. I think that the art style is good. I think that the music's really good. I think that like the color and the, the sort of like popping nature of the world is really nice. And I think once you go through it, especially a second time and you just lay bare the story, <laughs> bare, it, 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 it unfolds itself pretty clearly. And we're back to Yurakuma Rashi, thanks to the vote of Laura Rios. Thank you again for bringing me to episodes 5 through 8. Episode 5 brings us to a flashback. Talks about 11 years ago... There were Kuriha and the bear version of Ginkgo together with Kuriha's mother. And generally, like, a big theme of 5 through 8 is going to be flashbacks that set up and establish more about the past between Kuriha and Ginkgo. That's kind of the main direction. As well as information about Kuriha's mother and her connections to one of the teachers that is at the school um, named Yurika. Also part of the flashback from 11 years ago, child Kuriha found child Ginko among these bears that were slain on the battlefield. Just like tons of bears that are lying motionless dead. And Kuriha appears like an angel or messenger of the, of the bear goddess and befriends Ginko in that moment of desperation and total loneliness. We cut to the present, and Ginko and Lulu have suddenly decided to move in with Kuriha. They've, like, asserted their presence there, and um, they're enjoying their, as they call them, new roomy noodles, and trying to win back Kuriha's love and attention by making her food. And meanwhile, there's a plot twist that the girls at the school who had been pretending to befriend Kuriha in this episode actually had not been trying to befriend her. And by plot twist, I mean it's actually very obvious that's where this is going. There's not much of a twist at all. But we do find that out as audiences before, before Kuriha does, and then Kuriha learns it as well. Ginko and Lulu are going to go off to eat the leader who are, of the humans who is like doing the invisible storm stuff. But when they go to do that, they end up springing a bear trap and Ginko gets caught in the trap. Ginko gets out of the trap when Lulu springs a bear flash grenade at the scene and is able to like use that as a distraction and then save, save Ginko. And then like the next 
I think it's like next like two episodes. It's a lot of Ginkgo in recovery stage. In episodes six and seven, we get more information about Kuriha's mother, who is named Rhea. And the story that she had written that appears to be based on something that actually had happened to her and her daughter. And this story is the story of the moon girl and the forest girl. That basically there were these two worlds, the moon and the forest. They were separated from each other. And one day the moon girl accidentally dropped this pendant that was her mother's. And the forest girl grabbed it. And then the forest girl and moon girl dreamed of finding each other. And the forest girl was also very obviously Ginkgo. Just the same way the moon girl is very obviously Kuriha. Uh, they're both praying to see each other. And the like goddess of this world, Kumari is first like no you can't it's pride and arrogance but then as time goes on and she keeps praying she's like all right fine if your love's the real thing then you can cross over and see each other and the story ended up not getting finished because unfortunately Kuriha's mother ended up getting killed by a bear before that could actually happen so basically if episodes one through three and four are mostly about the situation around Sumika's death and you know, kind of bringing to justice Sumika's killers, then five through eight are setting up more of the backstory on Ginko's past with Kuriha, as well as setting up Kuriha's mother's death and revealing who that killer was. And it turns out that the killer of Kuriha's mother was her friend, her mother's friend, who is now the teacher, Yurika. We find that out in episode eight. Yurika is revealed to have been a bear that had been raised by a man who likes boxes. And he told her that only things that are pure and unsullied have value. And if you want to save them and keep them safe, you've got to protect them by putting them in boxes. Which, if you know Utsuna, this is a lot like coffins, right? So eventually this man who had prized and valued uh, Yurika ends up finding someone new or finding something new to go attach his love to. And in jealousy and anger... Uh, Yurika ends up killing this man so that she could basically preserve that love by not letting him move on to the next thing. And there's a lot of overlap here then between uh, Yurika's ideas from the man of putting love in a box and cutting it off before it can leave you and this idea that Ginko expresses elsewhere throughout the series so far of wanting Kuriha's love all to herself. So this sort of like all-encompassing selfish love to possess versus the love that more like lets go and is more liberated and free. And Yurika ends up kind of seeming to be the big bad of the show so far. Um, and she's maneuvering Kuriha to misunderstand the situation by making Kuriha think that Ginko had actually been the bear that killed her mother. And episode eight ends with a cliffhanger where it's Kuriha with a gun and a gunshot goes off. And she at the time had been aiming for Ginko with Lulu there. And on the other side was Yurika trying to mislead her to make this all happen. And meanwhile, Yurika basically like had forsworn the bear identity because she had chosen to put people in boxes and to live in boxes rather than choose love. And now she wants to basically put Kuriha in that box and preserve Kuriha because she sees her as like the succession of Yurika's love because she thinks that when Yurika, not Yurika, too many names. She thinks that when Rhea, the mother had Kuriha that basically her love had gone to the child instead of her. And so that's why she was jealous and angry. And now wants the child's attention and child's love and presumably would kill her too, I would think, because there's this imagery uh, happening early on when Kuriha's mother, Rhea, and Yurika first meet. And it's of Yurika cutting lilies and putting them in boxes because she wants to preserve their beauty, even though obviously that is killing them at the same time. So in terms of metaphors and imagery here, boxes and coffins seem to be pretty synonymous. And lilies representing Yuri, representing this love. You can see how this could possibly bode badly if she is allowed to put Kuriha in a box. Obviously, I skimmed over some things, but that's generally the plot premise of these four episodes. And I would say, like, overall, it's a better set of episodes than the first four. Um, while I was kind of researching this, I ended up Googling, you know, just people's thoughts. Like, does Yurikuma Arashi seem male gazy to people? And I didn't do a whole lot of research, but, like, one of the things that popped up was this blog called Boston Bastard Brigade. And there was this post made by a username King Baby Duck. 
And I mean, if we're going to trust anyone in the matter, it's probably King Baby Duck, right? And so King Baby Duck had actually posted a revision because originally they had given the show a 3.5 out of 10 after watching the first three episodes. They thought it was super male gazy and like kind of gross and they compared it to like the sex scenes in blue is the warmest color and they were just like put off by the overt sexuality of it all but then when they re went back to it and they continued past that point while they still think that some of the stuff earlier is like a distraction the show generally slows down on the overt sexualization and tends to actually tell a more compelling story about people who are on the fringes and left out and one of the things that kind of resonated with me from King Baby Duck, which is a very funny name, is this idea of how they kind of responded to the show through the lens of autism and the lens of like social cues, being accepted by people, being put in boxes, et cetera, et cetera, which not only would apply to people who have been discarded based on sexual orientation or the wrong kind of love, but also would apply to things like autism. And of course, there's a through line here with the previous show, Blue-Eyed Samurai, where I'm sure a character like Mizu, right, or Ringo could also fit into the spectrum of characters who have been uh, basically told that they're invisible. Someone who's been cast aside, like you know Mizu would be attacked by the invisible storm in this world. So there is that through line that they kind of saw more value in, and they went from a 3.5 out of 10 from three episodes to watching the whole show and giving it an 8.5 out of 10. And in general, I think I agree with King Baby Duck that the first three episodes especially, and then even with the OP, gives kind of the wrong message. I'm not opposed to the idea of having like sexualization in shows. I, I don't think there's anything wrong with having an anime that's sexual. That's fine. That that's okay. But I think the problem is that Yuriko Marashi is like confused sometimes tonally. And I think that like putting the overt sexualization in early sends the wrong idea of what the show's going to be. And like, you can charitably read it as like an expectation that's being subverted, but I think it'd be maybe stronger if that expectation wasn't set up. And I think it's especially interesting because the show repeatedly avoids, or I should say the people making the show repeatedly avoid showing the gore because these bears are like mauling people and eating their flesh. And we don't see the blood and the guts and the horror. So like, it's interesting that they're like really holding off and like very conservative with that kind of stuff, but then using very sexualized imagery to reflect these like young girls' attraction to each other. And I think like it's not inherently a bad thing, but it is kind of misleading and creates a weird tone situation with the show. Because when you get to five through eight, it's rarely like that. It feels like the show like took a turn and kind of they figured out what they were making this to be and it slows down a bit. Is it still contrived in some spots? Yeah. Is the pacing still weird in some spots? Yeah. But as I was watching, I was reminded of why I like Yurikuma Rashi. I think that it's themes of standing out from the crowd, that it's okay to stand out from the crowd and be different and not follow these social cues. Yes, it will likely lead you to being persecuted or feeling judged or feeling alone, but if other people who are also ostracized stand out and join with you, you can have solidarity and community outside of the herd. And so you're not actually alone so long as you remember and stand and fight for that version of love. I think there's like... Yuriko Marashi is kind of weird, but I feel like the values are in the right place. Like, its heart is in the right place. I guess if I had to, like, sum up the messaging of the show so far, it feels like it's rejecting that dichotomy of purity that Yurika and that man represent. Like, being against the idea that you have to be pure, and if it's sullied, it's worthless. So we gotta make sure everything's pure, we gotta cut it off before it gets impure. There's a part where, like, Yurika reflects on, like, some of the best memories she had with Rhea where, like, they were willing to let themselves be sullied together. There's this idea that, like, nothing in life is going to remain pure, but the purest thing of all, maybe, is to allow life to happen and not try to cut it off or restrict it for yourself or other people. And in, other, in essence, I'm basically saying that the show is about be gay, do crime. This is be gay, do crime, the anime. And I think that's good. I think it's a good overall messaging, even if it's sometimes you kind of squint at and it's like, Ikahara, did you really have to do that? Could you maybe like tone it down on that particular angle? Because I think otherwise, this show actually has a whole lot more to say than what it might first appear to be. Um, that being said, once it starts saying the things, it can get a little repetitive, and I don't think it's quite as fine-tuned as Utsuna. 
but I don't think it has to be. It's okay. He already made Utsuna. This is something else, and I appreciate it for what it is. Also, side note, I love all the emphasis on stars and, like, star projections on the walls. It reminds me, like, when I was in, like, high school, I had a Twilight Turtle that would project stars onto the ceiling. And I still, like, to this day have, like, this galaxy projector I use in my living room. I love those kind of, like, star projector things. I think that's cute, and I really like that that's part of the show as well. All right, folks, we have reached the end of the Yurakuma Arashi anime. I'm now going to talk about episodes 9 through 12. It ended last time, episode 8, with a cliffhanger as a gunshot rang out, where it seems to be that Kuriha may have shot Ginko under the assumption that Ginko had, in fact, killed her mother. We return in episode 9 to find out that Kuriha had, in fact, shot Ginko, but Ginko lives on. And Ginko, now in this, like, wounded state, speaks with the ghost of Mitsuko, who had been a representation of desire and lust. If you're anything like me, at this point, you're probably struggling to remember who Mitsuko is or how she fits into this, because even as I'm looking over on my notes, I'm getting confused about the names Yurizono and Yurika. So... It's one of the antagonist girls, let's just say that, who is somehow a ghost, or real or fake, is now speaking with Ginko. And Ginko, at this point, expresses jealousy over Sumika, that she in the past had been jealous of Sumika being so close to Kuriha, and knew that she was about to get eaten, but she watched her get eaten. That Ginko allowed it to happen. Mitsuko at this time warns Ginko about the other bear threatening Kuriha and merges with Ginko. Uh, one, this would imply that potentially Mitsuko is in fact a real ghost because she knows information that Ginko doesn't. And two, somehow they can merge. Uh, spirits can merge with people and don't worry about how that happens because it's not going to be elaborated on. It just does, I guess. Which, I mean, to be fair, if you're watching this as a fan of Utsuna, you're probably used to things that you just kind of got to roll with sometimes. There's also this part where one of the judges, uh, I think it's the Judge Sexy, is spying on girls with a, like, magnifying glass as they're, like, making out, and he's, like, talking about climax, and he is, like, literally male gaze in that moment. And this is one of those moments where I just kind of stop and... I look at it and it's like, maybe there is an argument to be made that it's like ironic or it's making a point about something. But there, there's a stage at which when you make fun of something or make a point about something, you just end up doing the thing. This is maybe pointing out that it's male gaze, but it's also like doing the male gaze. And I'm not sure it's doing it in a very poignant way. It's one of those tonally confusing moments where we have to interrupt the emotional storyline to have a male character ogle teen girls making out. That's a little... A little bad, uh, maybe. I don't know. It depends on what you're watching the show for and what tone you want the show to have. I, I spoke at length the last time about the sexuality stuff, so I won't belabor or harp on it anymore. Back to the main story, the stage has been set where both the teacher Yurika and Ginko are both poised to eat Kuriha to try to possess her. But there's a bit of irony where the Invisible Storm, who are Yurika's own students, end up shooting her, and she is dying and experiences visions of Rhea. So that's the end of Yurika, main antagonist defeated. We still got a couple more episodes left, though. We also get a flashback of Rhea, again, the mom, dropping off Ginko on the other side of the Wall of Severance in the past in order to protect her, but this kind of more flashbacks ensue where it shows that both Ginko and also young Kuriha had been willing to make these deals to forget each other if it meant they could be together. So it's like a fated like friendship or romance that's like building toward a potential reunion as we continue forward into the series. Also, the Invisible Storm girls have hooked up the corpse of a dead bear uh, to this like weapon for power, and it's like harnessing zombie energy. That actually does pay off later, but in the moment, it's just very weird and jarring that they're even doing this at all and kind of morbid, actually. But they do have the zombie-powered gun now. Lulu ends up finding the rest of Rhea's storybook, where we learn that the moon girl and the forest girl eventually cross over and have their promised kiss, which seems to be foreshadowing of exactly where this story is going to go for Ginko and Kuriha. 
And also we have Lulu trying to convince Kuriha to accept Ginko's love and to try to forgive her. But Kuriha is adamant, like, I'm not going to forgive bears. I can't just allow myself to forgive this. And so she sends Lulu past the wall of severance uh, in order to save her, but says, if you ever come back, I will shoot you. We are not friends. However, the Invisible Storm had been watching this whole time and now had confirmation that Kuria had helped the bears. With the ghost of Mitsuko urging her on, Ginko attacks the Invisible Storm girls one by one, killing them. I don't know if she's eating them, but she is definitely killing them uh, and diminishing their numbers before eventually turning her back on Mitsuko, deciding that her love was stronger than her desire. Ginko then approaches Kuriha with that new renowned sense of love and the willingness to be herself and, and never give up on love. And she talks to Kuriha, who's trying at this point to reject her and push her away. But Ginko is so insistent on telling the truth and by being there for her that they kind of have a bit of resolution here. But at that time, the Invisible Storm attack... Lulu then interrupts this situation, intercepts the bullet, takes the bullet for Ginko, and dies. The Invisible Storm capture Kuriha, Ginko's put on a plank over the edge of a building, and we get more dialogue about their relationship before Kuriha ultimately asks Lady Kumaria to hear out her wish and her prayer. And Lady Kumaria appears in the form of an angelic Sumika, who then descends there. And Kuriha at this time asks for a wish. And this doesn't have to go through the three judges, because apparently those three are like a, a hierarchy lower than Lady Kumaria. So she asks directly to Lady Kumaria, hey, I want to be a bear. Kuriha wants to be a bear so that she can actually be with Ginko. And this is kind of a, you know, opposite of what had happened when they were kids, where she had earlier had this resolution that it'd be better if Ginko was a human so she wouldn't have to be persecuted. And that was considered prideful by the judges because it was trying to change the one she loves. Whereas here, it's more... Kuriha changing herself for the one she loves, but not like in a toxic, bad way of someone changing themselves too much for someone they love. It's more like a self-sacrifice. Don't read into it too much. You know what it's trying to say. And uh, so she ends up making this deal and she and Ginko finally get to share their promised kiss. And the anime, much to, again, its credit, does not back away from showing a actual gay, queer kiss in the anime. It doesn't like you know, try to like imply things or, you know, use it as like a, a queer baiting. It like actually does the thing and that's good. And it's at this point that Yurikuma Rashi starts to wrap up because it is very much a fairy tale love story about these two who had been childhood friends finally reuniting on equal terms, be able to be together. And even though they are attacked in a barrage of bullets, there is the hope that they were able to be magically spared and taken to the other side of the wall where they can be together, which very much seems to be the tone of what's going on. Somehow what had all happened changes the whole scope of the city where the entire like architecture changes and like the insignia on the buildings change and it feels like there's some kind of revolution that has taken place where now there's one by one the potential of some of these girls in the invisible storm being inspired by this selfless display of love to risk being an outsider in order to stand up for their love and this is where we see a random girl who I don't think we've seen before, I don't think, she goes and reaches for the mecha zombie bear who has been like morning by a bunch of boxes and she like takes that bear and they're together and it's implied to be again this idea that there had been an inspiration for a new person to try to step out and do that expression of love and there's the hope that other people might one by one do that as well we also get a shot of Lulu and her brother, presumably in some form of afterlife, reading a story about Kuriha and Ginko, which leaves the ending a bit open as far as what happens to Kuriha and Ginko. And they don't really necessarily have the answer to it, but there is a cute moment where the brother ends up deciding, you know, instead of waiting for you to give me the promised kiss, I'm going to give you the promised kiss. And then he says to his sister, I love you, and Lulu ends up replying that she loves him too. And that's the end of Yuri Kuma Arashi a series that I ended up really enjoying about in the middle part after a little bit of a rocky start and admittedly a little bit of a rocky ending. I went back and forth kind of looking at how I feel about this and what rating I would give it on my anime list. And, you know, I went from an eight out of 10 to a six out of 10. And then I settled on a seven out of 10 at the moment. 
And I want to mention that I go back and forth on the score because my thoughts are still evolving on it, but I do feel like upon rewatching it, I have a stronger sense of the show and why I'm mixed about it. First of all, the pacing on Yurikuma Rashi is so odd. You start the show without all the information. You're kind of just thrown in. And then as it goes on, you get more and more of the information in retrospect through flashbacks, through story reveals. But while that's happening, very little is happening. Like very little is moving the story forward. So it kind of spins its wheel a lot. And I mentioned the antagonist being kind of, you know, throw awayable, kind of disposable. They're not a very strong cast of villains. I oftentimes forget who's who and don't really have a strong sense of attachment to them. So it's really a show that is about like three people with some plot characters like the brother of Lulu and Sumika that, you know, you need to know who they are, but they don't really have a lot of agency. They're just kind of martyrs of the story. It really is a story about Kuriha and Ginko and Lulu in that order. And I'm not saying that non-linear is bad. You can definitely tell a story by throwing you in and then sparing the details until later. Uh, this is something that Madoka Magica does, where it doesn't really give you all the information until later. And it's something that Serial Experiments Lane does, if you think it even gives you the information at any point. And one of my favorite game series, Nier, both uh, the original Nier Gestalt and Nier Replicant, as well as Nier Automata, are games where you don't find out a lot of key pieces of information until quite a bit later or upon multiple playthroughs. I'm okay with that concept if executed really well, but it felt to me like this wasn't necessarily executed so strongly when it came to the pacing. Again, is that feeling of it kind of spinning its wheels and not really advancing because not much is happening in the main story to be exciting. It's just a lot of pulling back and re-explaining things. And there's just elements I'm iffy on. Like, on one hand, Ginko's mistake of letting Sumika die was born out of her falling for Kuriha. It's born out of a jealousy from love and everyone makes mistakes. On the other hand, she allowed literal murder. Like she very much like tacitly complied with the idea of having the person that Kuriha cared most about um, literally murdered and eaten. And that's such a big deal that it is hard for me to really imagine them being together like, I'm imagining in the real world, like, you are in the situation where you are in, you have a crush on someone, right? And you then know that someone's about to murder your crush's best friend, and you just watch it happen. You watch as they're, like, stabbed and then, like, cannibalized, and then later it comes out and your crush is like, it's all right, man, I forgive you. That's really hard for me to believe, even in this fantasy setting with, like, magical bears and all the silliness. I think it's such a bold flaw that I don't think you can just like patch that up. So I found the resolution a bit unbelievable in terms of the character arcs because I'm just not convinced in that level of forgiveness. And maybe I'm too jaded to believe in that kind of unconditional love. I don't know. But I, I will say that to me, it escalated the stakes a bit too high for the resolution to quite feel right. That being said, I liked a lot of Yurikuma Rashi. When I think back on the show, I'm going to think about its themes of the invisible storm, the themes of exclusion, walls, and boxes, especially in relation to marginalized communities, queer communities, and I think especially coming from a Japanese creator, it's cool to see this kind of work that is unabashedly gay. And I like the boldness of Yurikuma Rashi quite a bit to just say what it wants to say and put it out there. And I think its messaging is so well-meaning about the idea of inspiring people through example to embrace their love and to be true to their love, even if it means other people won't understand them or might persecute them, but to stay true to that and to not deny it. I think there's a beauty in that. Um, even if it only works in this fantasy world, it's great, well-meaning, wishful thinking. And it's got pretty art and it's got a good soundtrack. And that ending song is a banger. I love the ending theme. And at the end of the day, the bears are adorable. The bears are so cute. So overall, Yurikuma Rashi, I'm settling on a 7 out of 10. This feeling could change over time. I like it. It's probably still my second favorite uh, Kuniko Ikahara anime behind Revolutionary Girl Utena. I'll need to check out Penguin Drum and Sarah's on my again someday to see if that's still how I feel. But at least in this moment at this time, that is my uh, overall assessment on Yurikuma Rashi. 
Thank you for those who have submitted this as a recommendation previously or voted on it, as well as anyone who is checking out this review now or in the future.